So like they said, my name is Nick Lesky. I work for Utah State University's Extension. I work for our, for our Integrated Pest Management Program. So I work a lot with commercial growers throughout our state, primarily on plant pathology issues and insect problems. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys this morning about some common pests. So insects and diseases that we see here in Utah on our pumpkins. And then of course, you'll find these same problems on our other cucurbit crops as well. So like winter squash, summer squash and melons. So first I'm gonna talk about diseases. So kind of an overview of diseases. A lot of the ones we see here in Utah are viruses and then different funguses. So this looks like a lot, but don't get overwhelmed because a lot of these management tactics that we implement, those will help control a lot of these problems. So first I wanna to talk to you guys about damping off. So this is, I'll get my cursor. Okay, so damping off is caused by various fungal species. And this usually occurs in our transplant production. So when you guys are first starting off your pumpkins early on, this is something you wanna be very careful of. It's caused by different pythiums, pythotheras, rhizocotonias, um, just a whole variety of pathogens. And it's widespread, not only in pumpkins, but all our vegetable crops that we transplant. And you'll usually see this in a greenhouse setting. And basically what's happening is the fungus is killing the vascular tissues within our stems. So I have a video I'm gonna show you quick. This is from the American Plant Pathological Society. So I'll play it at two times the speed and I'll explain what's going on. So basically damping off, any fungus that's associated with it, it has this resting structure. And then under the right conditions, usually the temperature or if there's a seedly presence, it'll form this fruiting body. And what's happening is this fruity body is producing spores and eventually it'll just burst. And these spores, they're gonna swim basically. And because they're swimming, that means they need a lot of moisture present. So if your potty mix or whatever you're using to start your seedlings is really damp, that's gonna encourage these spores to swim. And they're looking for those roots of the new seedling that started because they give off this um, chemical that allows them to be found. And they don't need like any wound on the root. They just do a good job of penetrating on their own. And then as soon as they penetrate, they're gonna be killing that vascular tissue. So this is the part that we see like in these photos where the seedling stem basically just kind of dries and rots out, ultimately killing the seedling. So you can see in this image here, it's just showing how it's killing that vascular tissue when those spores infect the roots. And then here's kind of an overall image of what's going on. And then it shows the different fungal species that cause that. So when we control damping off, sanitation is super critical. Um, what I do with my growing containers, I use the same growing cells every season. So I'll sterilize them in about like a 10% 10 per, 10 bleach solution for an hour. Um, when I'm watering, I want to, or when I notice any diseased plants, I want to remove them right away, including the soil, because I know that pathogens in the soil. Um, whatever space I'm working in, so like a greenhouse, I'm going to clean and disinfect uh, the benches and the trays. And then you can even purchase um, seeds, treat it with thurum. So I'm going to be growing Howden pumpkins this year. So I don't know if you can see, but these are all treated with thurum. So that'll help with any damping off prevention. And then of course, if you're growing on the ground, you wanna make sure there's a barrier between your pot and the dirt on the floor. So the next disease is um, called powdery mildew. 
And if you're familiar with powdery mildew, we get that on a lot of our landscape trees or flowers, vegetable and fruit crops. And it's a whole family of fungi. Um, different species uh, affect different host crops. So these are the two species that affect our pumpkins and other cucurbits. It's a widespread problem all across Utah. And it's super easy to identify. You see these white um, powdery fungal growth, which is the mycelium on our foliage. And then it infect, infections occur through windborne spores season long. And if the infections get bad enough, they can eventually just kill off the plant foliage, which can lead to other problems. And you, this usually occurs in conditions about 65 to 85 degrees with high humidity within the plant canopy, but not necessarily direct rainfall. So to manage this, um, early detection is key. So when you're out checking your pumpkins every day, you wanna be looking for the small fungal growth starting to occur on the leaves. There's resistant cultivars available, but if you provide adequate plant spacing, that'll prevent the spread of the pathogen from leaf to leaf. Then of course, at the end of the season, you wanna remove any debris or volunteer plants because that's where that fungus overwinters. And there's a lot of different fungicide products out there. So one of them is copper products, sulfur-based products, pyrethrins, mineral oils, and plant-based oils. So you, there's a lot of products out there. Always make sure to read the label to make sure that you can apply it on pumpkins and that the product is controlling powdery mildew. So let's talk about viruses quick. So the first one I want to mention is beet curly top virus, which you guys might be familiar with our tomato crops. This can also affect our squashes and pumpkins. However, that's kind of rare. We usually see it on other crops first, but it's vectored by this insect called the beet leaf hopper. And it's usually a concern from the spring to the summer when beet leaf hoppers are moving from our weeds up on the foothills to our vegetable crops. And there's, they don't, they're looking for specific plants. So they might feed on one plant, decide they don't like it and move on. Because of that, infections can occur randomly. But essentially what happens is our leaves become small, twisted and curled. You might see purpling on the veins and the leaves themselves will become really thick, stiff and crisp. And we might see premature ripening of our fruits. So next we have cucumber mosaic virus. This is a cucomovirus in that family. Again, this is rare on Utah pumpkins and squashes, but we do see it time to time. And it's actually spread by aphids and human handling. So when you're working from one plant to another, it's super important to like make sure we're washing our hands, making sure all our tools are sterilized and it can cause plant stunting and it can make this cool, mosaic pattern, which is kind of like these yellow light green patches on the foliage. And you might even see ring spots or different patterns on our fruits. Then I'm going to play you guys this video quick. This is how aphids feed and spread the virus. So they have piercing sucking mouth parts and they can pull it from one plant and it'll go into their salival glands. So when they feed on it, that's how it spreads. The next one is watermelon mosaic virus. This is in the Pody virus family. And this one's actually a lot more common that we see on our Utah pumpkins and squashes. And again, it's vectored by aphid feeding. It causes plant stunting. And the most distinguishing characteristic, which a lot of you growers might see is this leaf malformation. It almost looks like blistering on the foliage. And that's a sign of the watermelon mosaic virus. And we'll see that on our beans plants as well, melons and other cucurbits. And then the fruits, they'll get like these warts and discoloration. And then lastly is zucchini yellow mosaic virus. This is in the podivirus family. This is a rare one that we don't see a whole lot in Utah. But again, same thing, it's spread by aphid feeding and human handling, it causes stunted plant growth you get these warts and distorted colorations on our fruits. So let's talk about how we can manage viruses in general. 
So like I said earlier, sanitation is key. You want to disinfect your tools, especially when you're working from crop to crop. You want to remove any infected plants because unfortunately, once the plant is infected with a virus, there's no way to treat it. You're, it's kind of done for. So the best way is just to prevent it in the first place. If you have a lot of weeds nearby, you want to remove those because a lot of weed species can serve as an alternate host. And then you want to control insect populations that vector the viruses too. So like the aphids and beet leaf hoppers that I mentioned. And again, no chemical control options for viruses. So let's talk about gummy stem blight, or sometimes we call it black rot. This is caused by this fungus. And this is okay. We see this occasionally on our Utah pumpkins and squashes. And it'll affect the foliage, the stems, and the fruit. On our stems, if you see this kind of oozing gamosis going on, this is one of the key signs of gummy stem blight. On the fruits, you'll see this necrotic ring spots. And this fungus is both seed borne and soil borne. So when you're sourcing your seeds, you want to make sure they are disease free. And then the optimal conditions about 65 to 75 degrees and if there's long periods of moisture. So now I'm going to talk about some, so I'm going to talk about some more then we'll talk about how we can manage these different funguses and molds. So next we have Pythium fruit and root rot. These are caused by different Pythium species. They occur occasionally and its identifying characteristic is this white mycelium growth, which kind of looks like a cotton on the fruit structure. And the infection occurs through wounds on the plant where the fruit touches the wet soil. The pathogen overwinters on crop debris and weeds and on resting structures in the soil. Another one we have is Pythothera root rot caused by different Pythothera species. This is rare on our Utah pumpkins and squashes. The pathogen, it moves through surface water. So again, those spores swim through, this, through the water to access the plant. So if you have a lot of standing water around, that's a risk for this Pythothera fungus. Roots can be infected as well. Like you can see this pumpkin where we have this kind of sunken in rotted lesions. And then more often we see this where the plant crown or kind of where it's touching the soil, this becomes infected with Pythothera. And then white mold is the last one. This is um, a fungus that affects a lot of our root crops too, especially post-harvest when they're in storage. It's caused by Sclerotonia sclerotorium. This is rare on our Utah pumpkins and squashes, but I do see it a lot on other vegetables, especially root crops. And it's kind of like the other ones. It's infected the fruit can get affected and it occurs when the fruits are, are touching standing water. Again, you see this kind of fluffy white cotton like fungal growth. And then these spores, they'll form small, hard black fungal structures. And that's where the sclerotia develops. And that's kind of how the mold develops as well. Um, white mold often affects fruit through the blossom end and they become rotted and watery. Scler sclerotia may be present inside the rotted fruit as well. So that's definitely not something you want to deal with on your plants. So how can we manage all these rots and molds? Again, the first thing is the source certified free diseases, or you can find ones that are pre-treated with a fungicide. Um, you want to rotate your cucurbit crops every two to three years to avoid outbreaks in our fields. A lot of growers are commercial growers. And I think what it sounds like a lot of our giant pumpkin growers do is they'll use kind of a plastic mulch to prevent them touching the soil directly and they'll use drip irrigation. Um, smaller growers might use staking or mulch, mulching to prevent contact with the soil. And then of course there's different fungicides. So early treatment is critical. So I'm going to talk about Fusarium wilt. This is something that affects a lot of our vegetable crops. It's one species, but they develop different um, forms or sporicles, we call them, that affect specific vegetable crops. So this is the one that 
effects are pumpkins or other cucurbit crops. And this is unfortunately is very common in Utah pumpkins and squashes. It's both seed borne and soil borne. And what happens is you get this marginal yellowing or progression um, kind of, or just yellowing leaves of the plant in general. So if your plant looks like it's wilting, it's most likely Fusarium wilt. And the stem, especially near the crown, like in this photo, you can get these um, linear necrotic lesions that might develop. So verticillium wilt, it's another wilt fungus. It's caused by verticillium dahlia. This is also very common in Utah. And it does a lot of the similar, it has a lot of the similar characteristics to Fusarium wilt. So you'll see the wilting and yellowing of the crown leaves. And you'll see the light brown vascular discoloration in the roots. So here's a cross section of a stem that's been cut and you can see that brown discoloration. That's a key indicator of verticillium wilt. So to manage these, a lot of growers, they'll pick resistant varieties to begin with, or if they wanna grow like an heirloom variety, they'll graft them onto a rootstock of a variety that's known to show resistance. So this is, there's a lot of cool studies out there showing grafting as an option. So next is source again, source disease-free seeds, clean equipment and shoes when you're moving from one location to the other. Um, a lot of growers might use raised beds for better drainage. And what some people might do is they'll grow mustards as a cover crops. And because mustards have been shown to have kind of a biofumigant properties within the soil. So that's been shown to reduce um, Fusarium and Verticillium fungus. So, I mean, that's kind of interesting. And then fortunately, there's no chemical controls for Verticillium and Fusarium welts because it's occurring inside the plant. So a fungicide wouldn't be able to access it. So those are diseases. And now I'm gonna do a quick overview of some insect pests. So, so Gordon said, Ron Wallace uses mustard in his high tunnel. So that's pretty cool. So here's a list of insect pests. So we have aphids, different species of aphids that you might see, cucumber beetles, mites, squash bugs, grasshoppers, pill bugs, and thrips. So again, if you're familiar with aphids, there's several species out there. Some of the most common ones that we see in our Cucurbits is the green peach aphid, the melon aphid, and then potato aphid. They're very small, they're about pear-shaped, and they have really soft bodies. They reproduce asexually throughout our main growing season. So that means they give live birth and they have a really quick life cycle. Multiple generations can occur a season. And then they'll over when the fall temperatures cool, they'll start reproducing sexually. So they'll lay eggs on woody hosts. So if you have a lot of fruit trees or shrubs nearby your production, that's likely where the aphids are overwintering. But aphids, they have these piercing, sucking mouth parts that can cause stippling or leaf curling. And like we talked about earlier, they can also spread a lot of the viruses that can affect our plants. So here's a photo of a bunch of aphids on a pumpkin flower. They're active mid-season through the end of the growing season. And again, they vector viral diseases. So to manage them, you don't wanna over fertilize your plants because aphids are attracted to that, those high nitrogen levels. You wanna encourage natural enemies. So you, if you're familiar with like the ladybugs, um, lacewings, anything that can benefit your plants by killing off the aphids, it's good to have around. You wanna keep your area pristine and weed free because weeds can serve as an alternate host for aphids. Then of course, there's a lot of insecticide options too. So uh, malathion is an option, per permethrin is an organic option. A lot of our growers like to use insecticidal soaps or plant-based oils, which is what it does is it basically just kind of suffocates the aphids and it's outer coating. So those are an effective product. So cucumber beetles, 
in Utah, we have the Western striped cucumber beetle, and then we have the Western spotted cucumber beetle. They're obviously yellow, then they have the black stripes or the black spots, depending on the species. The larvae look like little worms. They have a brown head and they overwinter as adults. And they'll become active in the springtime once our temperatures hit about 50 degrees in the spring. So I know here in Utah, we're getting, I think this week we should be getting close to the 50 degree weather. So we might be seeing a lot of these insect pests starting to emerge. But here's some photos of the damage they can do. So I think it's down in Emory County. We have a lot of commercial melon production. So they have to deal with these beetles a lot. And what they can do is they can just cause major defoliation on our plants and the flowers. And they're just kind of a nuisance pest to have around. Here's a photo of them feeding on the rind of a pumpkin. So to manage these, again, the same pattern you guys are seeing is keep your crop area weed free because weeds serve as an alternate host. A lot of our, it sounds like a lot of you guys are using the floating row covers for season extension. That can also help exclude the beetles or a lot of other pests from accessing the plants. And then you can use plastic mulch and drip irrigation that can help deter the cucumber beetles destroy crop residue after the harvest. And then a lot of our commercial growers, they'll use lures and traps in their fields to help control the populations as well. And then of course I have insecticide problems, which I, or not insecticide problems, insecticide products, which can be used to control cucumber beetles. So let's talk about spider mites. These obviously aren't insects. These are little arachnids. And they're super small. You need like a little hand lens to really observe them. But here's an image of some of the damage that they can cause. They have piercing sucking mouth parts, which causes this stippling that we see on our foliage. And of course, they're called spider mites because they produce this webbing on our plants. So that's another key way for us to notice, notice them. And if there's enough of them, the damage they can cause is this generalized bronzing, reddish discoloration, and that can develop as the populations increase. And they're most common during hot and dry conditions. So you'll be starting to see them end of June and early July, especially. And they overwinter as adults in ground cover. So to manage them, you just wanna keep your plants healthy and free of drought stress, encourage natural enemies. There's a, another predatory mite that is beneficial that'll eat the spider mite like in this photo. Spider mites develop high resistance to pesticides. So we usually don't recommend spraying them, but there are options available if the problem is unbearable. So now we're gonna talk about squash bugs and everyone has their squash bug stories. So you're all familiar with them. They're, the, they're true bugs. They're in the Hemiptera family. The adults are flat, brown, gray. They have these little orange brown bands on the side. You don't wanna confuse them with like elm seed bugs, stink bugs, um, cone nose bugs. But they're all in the same family, but they're not squash bugs. The ones we're talking about look like this. The nymphs, or sorry, the eggs are these shiny brown bronze colored things. The nymphs, here's a photo of some on a pumpkin plant. They're bright green when they first, ha first hatch, but then as they mature, they become, they start to look more like the adults. And there's one generation a year that we see here in Northern and Central Utah. But if you live down in Washington County, you might see a second partial generation per year. And they'll overwinter as adults in protected sites around the building or underneath plant debris. And then the best way to manage them is early monitoring for eggs. So that's critical. So as soon as the season starts, you want to be out looking for these eggs and removing and destroying them. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share another screen about squash bug management. Okay. Whoops. 
wrong website. So if you go to our, can everyone see this screen? So when you go to our Utah Pest website, I linked um, an infographic on squash bug management. So here, here it is. So I talk about all the different ways that you can control squash bugs on here. It's just cool infographic. So I'll link it in the chat, but definitely print this out to have this, on, I don't know, have it on your fridge. And it just talks about all the ways that you can manage squash bugs. So different cultural control methods. I talk about different sanitation, variety resistance, crop rotation, timing of planting and then mechanical control. A lot of growers will use homemade traps, mulches, and then mechanical dis destruction is probably the number one way to control squash bugs on a small scale. And then different biological control methods. So some growers will use trap crops and they'll encourage that one species of tachinid fly that parasitizes squash bugs. And then of course, there are some chemical control options as well. So I'll link this um, guide in the chat for you guys to print out and study some more. And we made this just because squash bugs are a huge problem that a lot of people see. And we just think it'll be very helpful for people when they're controlling their squash bugs. Okay, let me go back. So the last one I wanted to talk about was thrips. If you guys are familiar with thrips, they're very small. The two species that we see in Utah are the onion thrips or the Western flower thrips. And they have these elongated brown bodies and they have two pairs of these fringed or hairy looking wings. And they have these kind of beak like mouth parts which they feed and kind of feed and suck behavior. So here's a picture of a pumpkin leaf. You can see the different thrip feeding that we have on there. And this causes different flecking and wounds and silvering scars on our foliage. So they don't cause too much of serious damage, but if there's enough of them, it can cause just kind of aesthetic damage and potentially growth damage. And they like favorable hot air conditions. To manage them, you can use yellow sticky traps. So here's a fungal gnat, and then here's what the thrip looks like. So you can see they're very small. Some growers, they'll plow underneath plant debris after harvest and then remove volunteer host plants. Um, some growers like to use overhead sprinklers because that water will wash away any thrip populations. And then of course, you wanna use like, these growers here are using a straw mulch in their high tunnel and out in their field that helps reduce, reduce thrips population. And then they have really, there's also natural enemies. So here's a picture of a minute pirate bug eating the thrip. So anything you can do to encourage natural enemies is helpful. And then thrips have rapid resistance to different insecticides. So we generally, generally don't recommend them. So Here's my contact question. So like Jim said earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, call me. I'm, my area of expertise is like plant pathology and different insect pests on vegetable crops. So if you have any questions related to that, I would love to answer.